Mae Sinclair, The Token. I have only known one absolutely adorable woman, and that was my brother's wife, Cicely Dunbar. Sisters in law do not, I think, invariably adore each other, and I am aware that my chief merit in Cicely's eyes was that I am Donald's sister. But for me, there was no question of extraneous quality, it was all pure Cicely. And how Donald? But then, like all the Dunbars, Donald suffers from being Scottish, so that if he has a feeling, he makes it a point of honour to pretend he hasn't it. I dare say he let himself go a bit during his courtship when he was not, strictly speaking, himself. But after he had once married her, I think he would have died rather than have told Cicely in so many words that he loved her. And Cicely wanted to be told. You say she ought to have known without telling. You don't know Donald. You can't conceive the perverse ingenuity he could put into hiding his affection. He has that peculiar temper, I think it's Scottish, that delights in snubbing and fault-finding and defeating expectation. If he knows you want him to do a thing, that alone is reason enough for Donald not doing it. And my sister, who was as transparent as white crystal, was never able to conceal a want, so that Donald could, as we said, have her at every turn. And then, I don't think my brother really knew how ill she was. He didn't want to know. Besides, he was so wrapped up in trying to finish his development of social economics, which, by the way, he hasn't finished yet, that he had no eyes to see what we all saw. The way her poor little heart was going, Cicely couldn't have very long to live. Of course, he understood that this was why, in those last months, they had to have separate rooms. And this in the first year of their marriage, when he was still violently in love with her. I keep those two facts firmly in my mind when I try to excuse Donald. For it was the main cause of that unkindness and perversity which I find it so hard to forgive. Even now, when I think how he used to discharge it on the poor little thing, as if it had been her fault, I have to remind myself that the lamb's innocence made her a little trying. She couldn't understand why Donald didn't want to have her with him in his library anymore while he read or wrote. It seemed to her sheer cruelty to shut her out now when she was ill, saying that before she was ill, she had always had her chair by the fireplace, where she would sit over her book or her embroidery for hours without speaking, hardly daring to breathe lest she should interrupt him. Now was the time, she thought, when she might expect a little indulgence. Do you suppose that Donald would give his feelings as an explanation? Not he. They were his feelings and he wouldn't talk about them, and he never explained anything he didn't understand. That, her wanting to sit with him in the library, was what they had the awful quarrel about, the day before she died. That in the paperweight, the precious paperweight that he wouldn't let anybody touch because George Meredith had given it him. It was a brass block surmounted by a white alabaster Buddha painted and gilt, and it had an inscription to Donald Dunbar and George Meredith in affectionate regard. My brother was extremely attached to this paperweight, partly, I'm afraid, because it proclaimed his intimacy with the great man. For this reason, it was known in the family, ironically, as the token. It stood on Donald's writing table at his elbow, so near the ink pot that the white Buddha had received a splash or two. And this evening, Cicely had come in to us in the library and had annoyed Donald by staying in when he wanted her to go. She had taken up the token and was cleaning it to give herself a pretext. She died after the quarrel they had then. It began by Donald shouting at her, what are you doing with that paperweight? Only getting the ink off. I can see her now, the darling. She had wetted the corner of her handkerchief with her little pink tongue and was rubbing the Buddha. Her hands had begun to tremble when he shouted. Put it down, can't you? I've told you not to touch my things. You inked him, she said. She was giving one last rub as he rose, threatening. Put it down. And poor child, she did put it down. Indeed, she dropped it at his feet. Oh, she cried out and stooped quickly and picked it up. Her large, tear-glassed eyes glanced at him, frightened. He isn't broken. No thanks to you, he growled. You beast, you know I'd rather die than break anything you care about. It'll be broken someday if you will come meddling. I couldn't bear it, I said. You mustn't yell at her like that. You know she can't stand it. You'll make her ill again. That sobered him for a moment. I'm sorry, he said. But he made it sound as if he wasn't. If you're sorry, she persisted, you might let me stay with you. I'll be as quiet as a mouse. No, I don't want you. I can't work with you in the room. You can work with Helen. You're not Helen. He only means he's not in love with me, dear. He means I'm no use to him. I know I'm not. I can't even sit on his manuscripts and keep them down. He cares more for that damned faith weight than he does for me. Well, George Meredith gave it me. And nobody gave you me. I gave myself. That worked up his devil again. He had to torment her. It can't have cost you much, he said. And I may remind you that the paperweight has some intrinsic value. With that, he left her. What's he gone out for, she asked me. Because he's ashamed of himself, I suppose, I said. Oh, Cicely, why will you answer him? You know what he is. No, she said passionately. That's what I don't know. I have never known. At least you know he's in love with you. He has a queer way of showing it then. He never does anything but stamp and shout and find fault with me. All about an old paperweight. 
She was caressing it as she spoke, stroking the alabaster Buddha as if it had been a living thing. His poor Buddha. Do you think it'll break if I stroke it? Better not. Honestly, Helen, I'd rather die than hurt anything he really cared for. Yet look how he hurts me. Some men must hurt the things they care for. I wouldn't mind his hurting, if only I knew he cared. Helen, I'd give anything to know. I think you might know. I don't, I don't. Well, you'll know some day. Never, he won't tell me. He's Scotch, my dear, it would kill him to tell you. Then how am I to know? If I die tomorrow, I should die not knowing. And that night, not knowing, she died. She died because she had never really known.